We're ready for our second class. The title of the second class is They Shall Trust in Yahweh. They that trust in Yahweh shall be as Mount Zion. And those are the exact same words that are in our hymn number 62. So if you'll join me now in singing hymn number 62. Now we'll share these words from Psalm 125. If you'll join with me. They that trust in Yahweh shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth forever. As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so Yahweh is round about his people from henceforth, even forever. For the rod of the wicked shall not rest upon the lot of the righteous lest the righteous put forth their hands into, unto iniquity. Do good, O Yahweh, unto those that be good, and to them that are upright in their hearts. As for such as turn aside unto their crooked ways, Yahweh shall lead them forth with the workers of iniquity. But peace shall be upon Israel. We're ready now for our second class, and we'll ask Brother David to continue on the topic they that trust in Yahweh shall be as Zion. Brother David.
Good afternoon once again, brothers and sisters. So we've considered the background to the Songs of Ascent. We've seen the role that they could play in the journey up to Jerusalem three times a year. We've seen the role that they played in the life of Hezekiah and, and considered how that we need to make them our songs so that for each one of us as we make our journey to Zion, we can be strengthened and encouraged on our journey. We saw how that Hezekiah was sick to death. We saw that he was unable to go up to the house of the Lord. He was unable to ascend the house of Yahweh. And really, we're all in that situation, as we're going to consider now as we get into the songs of degrees themselves. And yet, Hezekiah was able to go up. He was able, he was made able by the power of God. He was healed and was once again able to ascend the hill of the Lord and to worship. So in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 12, it says, Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet. And the word meet there means to enable, to qualify, and to make able. And so we too have been made able. We've been qualified to be able to ascend the hill of the Lord through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us able to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. And that was Hezekiah, who was then able to ascend the hill of the Lord. He was able to worship. He was able to have a child um, to sit upon the throne of David through the strength of God, as his name means, strengthened by Yah. So when we come to Psalm 120, we can find ourselves there as Hezekiah would have found himself in Psalm 120, as he was on his bed in that desperate situation and encompassed around by the, by the Assyrians. Psalm 120 is the first of the songs of ascent. And the person in Psalm 120 is in distress. We begin the ascent, as it were, with somebody who's in distress, that's writing about being in distress, as Hezekiah was when he was unable to, to go up. Psalm 120, a song of ascent. In my distress I cried unto Yahweh, and he heard me. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue, which for Hezekiah, as we've, we've looked at, was the Assyrians and Rabshakeh that was um, deceiving the people and speaking with a deceitful tongue. And as we've noticed, we referred to briefly that this person in Psalm 120, the psalmist, is encompassed about by lying lips, and they're not in the land of Israel. Uh, we could say that they are unable to ascend the hill of the Lord. And there, there's a connection maybe here, too, between this and the previous psalm, actually. Um, at the end of Psalm 119, the last verse, it says, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek thy servant, for I do not forget thy commandments. That's the situation of the person here. It's almost like the uh, Ruth the Moabitess who went out of the house of bread and into the land of Moab and then was unable to ascend the hill of the Lord, was, uh, as it were, outside of the ecclesia. And this person here is, in a way, in that situation, as we've read in verse 5, Woe is me that I sojourn in Meshech, that I dwell in the tents of Kedar. My soul hath long dwelt with him that hateth peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. So this person is in distress outside of the land of Israel, and as it were, a lost sheep, and unable to go up to the feast in Jerusalem. A stranger in a strange land, which were the names of the sons of... Uh, of um, Moses, Exodus chapter 18, it says, Her two sons, of which the name of the one was Gershom, for he said, I have been an alien, a stranger in a strange land, in Midian. And that's what these people are here. They're in a strange land, outside of the land of Israel. Jesus felt that way, actually, as well. He had to also, as a child, he had to go to Egypt and was outside of the land of Israel and maybe his family then was unable to go up 
to Jerusalem. But he also said, uh, or also, prophetically it says in Psalm 69, verse 8, I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. And that's how it was for Jesus and his family at certain times. We'll remember that in the Gospels, how they thought he was beside himself. And so um, he was a stranger in his own land. And sometimes we can feel that way as well. Psalm 120 verse 2 talks about <clears throat> the deceitful tongue. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips, from a deceitful tongue. The word there for deceitful, it means deceit, but it also means negligence, laziness, or laxness, and slackness. And I think that's worth considering because loose lips, a loose tongue, we can say things and cause a lot of damage without even really thinking about it, just by being lazy. And that's maybe why it's associated in that way, that the deceitful tongue is a lazy tongue. Uh, it could be very determined in, in deceit uh, as well. The lying lips are definitely that. But it's, uh, it's worth thinking about that. In verse uh, 3, where it says false, it's the same word as deceitful in verse 2. What shall be given unto thee, or what shall be done unto thee, thou false tongue? So in verse 4, it says, what will be done to this false tongue? Sharp arrows of the mighty with coals of juniper. Sharp arrows of the mighty one with coals of uh, juniper. The word there for mighty is gibor. Uh, the mighty warrior is usually how that word is used, like um, the name of God, isn't it? El gibor, or, the, uh, or Gabriel, I think his name comes from that. Uh, Gibor El, the mighty one of God. So this is a mighty one uh, here, the, the sharp arrows of the mighty one. The word arrow is used for lightnings as well, lightning that comes in, in a storm. We are familiar with that. Um, that's similar. It's like the arrows of God is how scripture um, looks at that. And it, you can see that in Habakkuk chapter, chapter 3, verse 11. We won't turn it turn it up. So the arrows of God. So the, the tongue is, is like an arrow, like a, a sword uh, that, can, uh, that can cause so much damage. And we see here how God uses like for like uh, to, to deal with the tongue. Then he uses um, his arrows, uh, his judgments, and, uh, and overcomes that, the arrows of the mighty one. Uh, with coals of juniper, as it talks about in verse 4. The tongue is referred to as a sharp sword. Um, we're not going to turn to these passages for the sake of time, but the tongue is referred to as a sharp sword in Psalm 64, verse 4, and uh, as a bow that shoots out arrows of falsehood in Jeremiah 9, verse 2. An appointed arrow in Jeremiah 9, verse 7, and fire in Proverbs 16, verse 27. Uh, James chapter 3, and I, I think we will turn this passage up. Um, we will be coming back to the, the Songs of Ascent shortly, but uh, James chapter 3, where it says so much about the tongue, and it's worth thinking about because it, it features so strongly in this psalm. James chapter 3 says in uh, verse 2, For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and all, able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which, though they be so great and are driven of fight, fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter, matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature." And it is set on fire of hell. 
For every kind of beasts and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and has been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either of vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. So we see how dangerous the tongue is, and we're very familiar with this. One little phrase there that James um, described about the tongue is he said, It setteth on fire the whole course of nature. And uh, in John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus says, um, second here, John 8, verse 44. Speaking to the uh, scribes and the Pharisees, I think, John chapter 8, verse 44, he says, You are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. For he was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in truth, because there was no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. So Jesus is referring, I think, here to the, to the serpent and to the serpent's seed who he's comparing them to. And the serpent was a murderer because of his lazy tongue and, and what he said and the deceptive words and the half-truths that deceived the woman and, and set on fire the whole course of nature. Isn't it true that this whole world is a result of the destruction of the tongue and of the falsehood of the serpent that deceived Eve and brought upon brought sin into the world, and so it really does. Uh, it really does have that idea, the tongue, and it really does have that power. And so we we need to to think about that, and and that's what the the focus here is in Psalm 120. So the tongue, in a way, becomes a symbol of our nature, of our flesh. Uh, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, and it all comes through that little member and can cause so much, so much damage, as it did with the, the words of the serpent, as we've said. And it brought enmity into the world. And that's all the wars that we have in the world are because of different ideologies and, and, that are striving against each other, that enmity that is brought into the world because of sin. And that's how the psalm goes on to speak of in verse 6 and 7. My soul hath long dwelt with him that hateth uh, peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. And that's the world uh, around us, that it's, it's like that. They are for war. It's the enmity that's in the world. And so really, Psalm 120 does give us that picture. It's outside the land of Israel. It's somebody in distress. It's somebody in the world. It's somebody surrounded by deceit, by the lying tongue, and uh, dwelling with the one that hates peace, that is always for war. You can think of the Jewish people in exile, and this describes their exile and how they were treated and expelled from one country to another outside of the land of Israel. Now, the beautiful thing in this psalm is when it begins in verse 1, it says, In my distress I cried unto Yahweh, and he heard me. And we can be assured that when we may find ourselves in Psalm 120 in distress, maybe as a lost sheep, maybe gone astray, or have those, those kind of trials around us, that when we cry to Yahweh, he will hear us. There's that assurance in Psalm 120. In my distress I cried unto Yahweh, and he heard me. And the thing about this psalm is that the psalmist recognizes his situation. 
He recognizes that he's outside of the land of Israel. He recognizes that he's dwelling in Meshach. And he says, woe is me that I'm sojourning in Meshach, that I'm dwelling in the tents of Kedar, that I'm with those who hate peace. Woe is me. And he, he recognizes what is around him. And that's what we need to do is to, in our distress, to cry to God and he will hear us. We need to recognize our situation. We need to recognize our natural situation. We need to recognize that flesh has to be put to death, that the tongue has to be tamed, even though no one can tame it, but the word of God can tame it through our hearts by putting the word of God into our hearts. And so Psalm 120 brings us to the first step in, in our journey, presents us with the first step. And that first step is to recognize our natural situation and to recognize that flesh has to be put to death. That is the first step on our journey. And then we're ready to start our journey. So then we come to Psalm 121, a song of ascent. Just a little uh, side note, Psalm 121 has a different title than all the others uh, by one letter, um, which, is, uh, which is interesting. I'm not exactly sure why. They all say a song of the ascent or song the ascent. And here in this one, it's a lamed for the ascent or to the ascent. So that's uh, just an interesting piece of trivia for you. So Psalm 121 begins, a song of ascent, or a song for the ascent. I will lift mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. <clears throat> when we were recently in Israel, we were just driving up from the Dead Sea, and we read the psalm together, and we were just driving on the road that goes from the Dead Sea up to Jerusalem. And uh, Josh was reading it, and it, so it says, A song of the ascent, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. And as we were sitting in the car, I was looking up the road. And right in front of me are the mountains of Jerusalem. And I think that's exactly what this, uh, that's the hills that it's talking about. That's obvious, actually, because we've already looked at the context and, and the progression throughout all these psalms. Because when we come to the end, we're in the sanctuary. It's in Jerusalem. That's the destination of the songs of ascent. So when it says, I will lift up mine eyes to the hills, and we were coming in the direction from Meshach and from Kedar, in that direction, it was behind us. And we're now starting to drive up to Jerusalem, and you lift up your eyes to the hills. Because why do you lift up your eyes to the hills? Because it's your destination. That's where you're going. And you're looking toward where you're going. I will lift up mine eyes to the hills. From whence cometh my help? And isn't that the question that we'll ask ourselves when we recognize where we are? We recognize our situation, our personal situation in Psalm 120. And we say, I need to make this journey. I want to make this journey. And we set out on that journey. And then we look at the destination and we say, how am I going to do this? How am I going to make this journey? It's such a, a long way and it seems so far. It seems so difficult and we feel inadequate and we don't think that we can, we can do it. And so the psalmist says, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills to my destination from whence cometh my help? How am I going to do this? And then the reply is in verse 2. My help comes from Yahweh, which made heavens, the heavens and the earth. So if that's our help, then we're fine. We're fine if, if that's the one who's helping us, the one who made the earth, the one who created the heavens is with us on our journey, then we can, we can have confidence. And so Psalm 121 is guaranteed help from the creator of the heavens and the earth from now until the kingdom. That is Psalm 121. 
guaranteed help from the guardian of Israel. And that's the word that's the key word in the psalm is, is, uh, is the guardian. And uh, it's, it's in uh, many times in this psalm. So in verse 3, he that keepeth, he that is the keeper, the guardian, will not slumber. Verse 4, behold, he that keepeth is the guardian of Israel, the guard of Israel, the watcher of Israel, the keeper of Israel. That's the same word. He that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. Verse 5, the Lord is my keeper. That's the same one. He's my, my guardian. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve. That's the same one word again as a verb. The Lord shall preserve. He shall be the, the guardian, the keeper, to keep thee, to guard thee from all evil. He shall preserve. That's the same again. He shall preserve thy soul, your life. The Lord shall preserve. Again, the same, the, the same verb. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and forevermore. <clears throat> so that's the key word in, in, in this psalm is, is that verb shamar, to keep, to watch, to guard, to keep safe, to preserve. And it appears in those six places here in this psalm. Verse 3, it says, He will not suffer thy foot to be moved, to stumble, to slip, to trip. That's the, the, the idea. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. So we have this assurance that as we make that journey, it's a song for the journey, it's a song for the way, because we're walking, we're going, and he's going to be with us so that we're not going to trip, we're not going to slip, on the journey. He's not going to let your foot slip. So it's a song for the way, but it's also telling us that he's going to be with us every step of the way. He's going to be with us intimately on our journey with every step that we're going to make. Because if he's not going to let us stumble, if he's not going to let us slip, then he's going to be with us for every single step of the journey. He's going to be with us. So he's with you intimately on your journey for every step. Verse 5 and 6, it says, The Lord is thy keeper, the Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. Now, as you are in, the, in that desert, and I, I just tend to think of the Dead Sea area because, one, you're, if you're coming from Kedar, that's the direction that you're coming from. And... <clears throat> As a wilderness journey, I haven't spent a lot of time. I've never been in the Sinai, you know, so, but this is, it's an experience at the Dead Sea. And actually, when we were in Israel, we, um, the one night, at the, we spent one night at the Dead Sea at En Gedi at a, a youth hostel there um, with some other Christadelphians. And it was so hot in the daytime, as it would be, right, in the summer down by the Dead Sea, but at nighttime, it didn't cool off. I thought at night it was supposed to get cooler in the desert, but it didn't. And then you go and turn on the tap, and you turn on the cold tap, and you leave the cold tap on and on and on, and it's still the hot tap. It never becomes the cold tap. There is no cold tap. There's no cold shower, and you're really, really thankful for air conditioning at that point because it's, it's really hot. So here, it makes this so uh, applicable when you think about that journey. That journey through the wilderness, um, incidentally, we did spend another night in, in the Negev Desert, and it actually was cool at night. So it, down by the Dead Sea, I guess the air must be trapped in there, and it doesn't seem to cool down very much. Um, but in this psalm, as you make that journey, it says, The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day nor the moon by night. And that's very real in that type of a wilderness journey when you think about what the sun is like and how you need that, that shade. But there's more to this than that uh, because when we think of the wilderness journey and we think of the sun uh, and, the, and, the, and the moon, uh, we also think of the, and of day and night, we think of the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. And so let's just, uh, for a moment, uh, we're going to uh, come back to the Songs of Ascent here in a minute, but we're going to turn to Nehemiah. 
in chapter 9. We're going to start reading at verse uh, 12. Moreover, thou ledest them in the day by a cloudy pillar, and in the night by a pillar of fire, to give them light in the way wherein they should go. Thou camest down also upon Mount Sinai, and spakest with them from heaven, and gavest them right judgments and true laws, good statutes and commandments. Uh, just one sec. We're going to go to verse uh, uh, 19. Sorry, verse 19. Yet thou in thy manifold mercies forsookest them not in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud departed not from them by day to lead them in the way, neither the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way wherein they should go. Thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them and withheldest not thy manna from their mouth, and gavest them water for their f thirst. Yea, forty years didst thou sustain them in the wilderness, so that they lacked nothing, their clothes waxed not old, and their feet swelled not. Verse 18, it talks about the molten calf, uh, that they made a molten calf. And they said, this is your God that brought you from out of Egypt, and they wrought great provocations. Verse 19, it says, Yet thou in thy manifold mercies forsookest them not in the wilderness, the pillar of cloud departed not from them by day. So even though they made a golden calf, even though they provoked God to anger in so many ways, God never took away the pillar of cloud. He never took away the pillar of fire to lead them in the way, to give them light, and he always gave them food in the wilderness, and he always gave them water on their whole journey, even when they messed up. And that's, brethren and sisters, for us. When we mess up, God doesn't desert us. He doesn't just leave us and forget about us. Even when Adam and Eve sin, God is the one that goes and seeks them out and finds them in the garden and brings them back to him. And so on our journey, when it says that he's going to be with you every step, even when you, even when you mess up, he's still going to be with you and he's going to try and bring you on the way, and that's what it's telling us. The pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud didn't depart from them. I would have loved the pillar of cloud in the, in, the, in the wilderness because it would have been the shade. It would have been the shade for you by day. When it says the sun shall not smite thee by day, it's the idea of the pillar of cloud that it was there providing shade for them and providing the way that they should go. And at night, in the darkness, in the black night, in the wilderness, the pillar of fire was there to guide them and give them light, so that uh, <clears throat> probably so they could travel at nighttime, because traveling in the daytime doesn't seem like a good idea when it's over 40 degrees. So they they probably did travel in, in the nighttime, and so God was with them by day or by night, and never took those things away from them and preserved them on that journey. So in Psalm 121, our guardian will not slumber. He's always available to us, day or night. He will preserve us from all evil. He will preserve our life. When we go out, when we go out to work, when we go out to school, when we go out to, to do what we have to do in this world, he will be with us in our going out. And when we come home, when we come home to our families, uh, and to our ecclesia, he will be with us when we come in. He will be with us in every aspect of our life, and he will be with us every step of the way. <clears throat> to Chronicles chapter 15, verse 2, it's from the reign of uh, Asa. It says, the Lord is with you. This is what the prophet says to him. The Lord is with you while ye be with him. And if ye seek him, he will be found of you. That's our God. And he's, he's promised that. He will be with us on this journey, on this ascent. <clears throat> and so when we, when we wonder where will our help come from, how are we going to do this journey? How can we manage this? Uh, we don't feel like we can do it. Then 
Psalm 121 tells us that we can do it, not because of ourselves, but because of the guardian, because of the watchman of our lives, because of our God who is going to be with us uh, while we be with him. And, and even when we, when, we, when we stumble, even when we, we, we turn aside, he's going to bring us back. He's going to try and bring us back. As we saw, he never took away the, the pillar of cloud or the pillar of fire, and he never took away the manna, and he always gave them water, and he always led them in the wilderness. <clears throat> so then in Psalm 120, we, we saw that we have to recognize our natural situation. We have to put flesh to death in our lives. Psalm 121, we acknowledge where help comes from. And that's, that's important. I will lift mine eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. And we need, to, we need to remember that and to say it. My help doesn't come from me. My help comes from Yahweh, which made the heaven and the earth. That's where, where my help comes from. We cannot accomplish this journey by our own strength. But we cannot fail if the creator of the heavens and the earth is with us every step of the way, as he will be um, if we are with him. So first we recognize our natural situation, and then we acknowledge where help comes from. My help comes from Yahweh, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. Incidentally, in this, uh, this key word that we noticed in Psalm 121, the, the keeper, the watchman, uh, it's the same word that's used in Genesis chapter 3 where it talks about the way to the tree of life, that there was the flaming sword that, that there was the guard of the way to the tree of life. And that's where we're going in this, in this journey is to, to Zion, but it's the way to the tree of life. And Yahweh is the guardian of the way to the tree of life, and he's our guardian in this psalm. So then we must go the way of the pillar of fire. And as long as we go the way of the pillar of fire, Yahweh, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the guardian of Israel, will be with us. And so we acknowledge where help comes from. <clears throat> Psalm 122, a song of ascent of David. So this is a, another in, one with a slightly different title, uh, just because it's of David. This is a psalm of David. A song of ascent of David. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Now, David was somebody who, for many years in his life, wasn't able to go to the house of the Lord, where um, I mean, the temple wasn't built yet, but there was the tabernacle, uh, there was worship, and he wasn't able to participate in that because he was running from Saul. He was in the wilderness. His parents, he had to take his parents to Moab uh, for safekeeping at one point. So uh, David definitely could have found himself in these, these Psalms, and this one's written by him. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. To stand in the gates of Jerusalem is a beautiful thing. I actually had never really thought past that. Uh, that um, that's their destination, to Jerusalem. Uh, and we, we want to enter in through the gates of Jerusalem into the city. Um, the gate of the city is Obviously, we've learned about the gate of the city, and we, we know quite a bit about it from when Ruth, uh, for example, um, when they were making the decision, it was made in the gate of the city. Um, I just recently found out about this when we were in, in Israel, um, that uh, there's, there are certain cities that have what they call a Solomonic gate. It's a specific design that seems to come from the reign of Solomon. It's uh, uh, the archaeologist uh, Yigal Yadin, who was so involved also in the scrolls, that also noticed um, this because um, I have the verse on the screen here in a minute. We'll look at it. It's in Kings. Uh, but this is one of those gates. Uh, this is at uh, a place called Hazor, uh, Tel Hatzor. It's up in the north, uh, and there's a lot of biblical connections to the city. 
this is the city gate as it is today, and it's one of those uh, gate designs that's close to, uh, that was uh, from uh, the reign of Solomon, as we understand. And you can see, uh, this is a, another angle of it, so on the top left is where you'd come in, and you can see that beside the gate there's these chambers beside the gate. So there's six big chambers beside the gate. And of course, this is where the judges would sit. This is where, um, to gain entrance to the city, you have to come through the gate. If you control the gate, you control the city. So when in the Promises of Abraham, it says you will possess the gate of your enemies. If you possess the gate, you possess everything. So when um, Samson takes the gates of the city from Gaza and carries them to Hebron, where the promises were made, he, this is what he's thinking of. Possess the gate of your enemies. So Solomon, okay, he demonstrates this, gets the gate and possesses the gate to Hebron. And he's saying to Judah, okay, guys, it's yours. Go get it, right? He, he, he took away their defenses. So when you come in through the gate, um, <clears throat> maybe if you're going to do commerce in the city, you're going to have to talk to somebody here um, because they might they're gonna want some payment from you. If there's decisions to be made, um, all those things are going to take place in the gate. And I'll just show you, this is the verse, um, it's in 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 15. It says, this is the, uh, the reason of the levy which King Solomon raised, for to build the house of the Lord and his own house and Milo, and the wall of Jerusalem, and Hatsor, Megiddo, and Gezer. So this is the verse that Yigo Yedin looked at, and, and he noticed the same gate design at uh, Tel Hatsor, at Megiddo, and Gezer. Isn't that amazing? So uh, he dated it, amongst other things, to the reign of Solomon because this verse brings those three cities together. And when you go and do archaeology in those three cities, they all have the same gate design dating from the time of Solomon. In Amos chapter 5, verse 15, it says, Hate the evil and love the good and establish judgment in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. So when it says, our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem, that's where you gain entrance to the city. You don't just walk in through the gate. You have to gain entrance to the city through the gate. There's judgment in the gate. And that idea is, is reinforced because it says, Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem is builded as a city that is compact together, whither the tribes go up, the tribes of Yahweh, unto the testimony of Israel. And we've talked about how they would do that at the Feast of the Feet, to give thanks unto the name of Yahweh. For there are set thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. And so judgment took place in the gate. <clears throat> I'd like to just uh, keep her hand in, in uh, the Songs of Ascent and turn to Revelation chapter 22 for a moment. Revelation chapter 22 and at verse 12. Jesus says, and behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. That's the reward to be in the, uh, in the community, in the Jerusalem community that, uh, that the Lord Jesus Christ is creating. Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates of the city. So to enter in to the gates of the city is to gain entrance to the city, to gain entrance to the community. And that's what we have to do. So the, the psalmist here, David, is, is joyful. He's, he's happy to go to the house of, of, of God, to enter into Jerusalem. There isn't an apprehension to going through the gate. Uh, but we have to go through the gate to enter into the city. And that is, that is where, um, where we have, that we may enter in through the gate and where judgment takes place. 
And figuratively, in Revelation, a right to eat of the tree of life is synonymous with entering in through the gates of the city. So it's entering into God's kingdom. To enter in through the gate is to enter into that community, the Jerusalem community, the, the community of the saints. <clears throat> it tells us in verse 3 that Jerusalem is builded as a city that is compact together. Built as a city that is compact together. The word compact, it means to join, associate, and it comes from the same root as friend. It comes from the same as fellowship comes from the same as the city of Hebron, which is uh, the city of fellowship. The word for a friend is Haver. It's the same as Hebron. And, uh, and um, also um, in Israel, they say, you know how we say uh, like our, our guys, our group, our posse, right? Whatever word you want to use, whatever word is cool. So in, in Israel, it's the Hevra. Right? The Hevra, our group of friends. We have friendship together. And so this word has the idea of friendship and fellowship. It's a community, it's a city that is fellowshiped together. And when we enter in through the gates, then we are in that city that is compact together. It is, uh, it's, it's friends together and the tribes of Yahweh go up to the testimony of Israel in that place. So it says, Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. And that's where judgment takes place. Jerusalem is builded as a city that is fellowshipped together, whither the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, unto the testimony of Israel, to give thanks unto the name of the Lord, for there are set thrones of judgment. That's the, the throne of judgment, the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are set thrones of judgment. And we have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. The thrones of the house of David. Then notice what it says in the next verse. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. And isn't that beautiful, brethren and sisters? Because we know that we will prosper at the judgment seat of the Lord Jesus Christ if we love Jerusalem, if we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, for that community. And when I say Jerusalem, I mean everything that is to do with Jerusalem. Um, it's the, the Jerusalem community that's based on the new covenant in Christ. That is the, the, the community in Galatians chapter 4, verse 26, it uses that as a, as a uh, the, the new covenant is, is Jerusalem, which is above. It says in Galatians 4, verse 26, but Jerusalem, uh, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. It's, the, it's the, the new covenant in Christ. That's the Jerusalem community. And so, therefore, we, we love God's purpose. We should. We love God's purpose working out. And that's why we love the return of the Jews, the regathering of the Jews, because it's the process of the restoration again of the kingdom to Israel. And we seek the prosperity also of our community. We pray for and seek the peace of, uh, of the prosperity of, of Jerusalem in the sense of our ecclesial family as well, because all these things are coming together when the kingdom is restored and the Jewish people are restored and they enter into the new covenant and the saints are with uh, ruling in Zion. All these things come together and all of them um, are centered upon Jerusalem. <clears throat> so when we, when we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, it's, it's all these things that we see coming together as God works his purpose out. So we pray for and seek the peace and prosperity of Jerusalem for the sake of our brethren and ecclesial family. And that's what this psalm goes on to say. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. Peace be within thy walls and prosperity within thy palaces. That we can think of it in that spiritual sense as peace within our ecclesial walls and prosperity within our ecclesial walls. Because, verse 8 says, for my brethren and companions' sakes, I will now say, peace be within thee. 
And we can think of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all his work that he did and, and how he gave his life, it was for the Jerusalem community. And it was so that um, it was for his brethren and companions' sakes. He did it. He did it for his brethren and companions' sakes so that he will be able to say, peace be within thee. It's his work to bring healing into that body. Because of the house of Yahweh our God, I will seek thy good. So there's set thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. But those who love thee shall prosper. So our feet will stand in the gate where judgment takes place to enter the city. We will prosper at the throne of the judgment of the house of David if we love Jerusalem and we will obtain entrance into the city walls of the community that is fellowship together. So we must pray for the peace of Jerusalem and seek for peace within the walls of our fellowship community for the sake of the house of Yahweh and for the sake of our brethren. Sorry, I forgot to put on these slides. Um, this is uh, the, how Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together. And you can see the definition there on the bottom right. So now we can review. And, uh, and here is to uh, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Uh, they shall prosper that love thee. And this is the word for prosper, which is to be safe, secure, especially used of one who securely enjoys prosperity. That's what it means to prosper and to prosper at the throne of judgment, to be safe, to be secure. And that's how we can be if we love Jerusalem and the things of Zion. So let's keep moving on. So Psalm 120, we recognize our natural situation. Flesh has to be put to death. Psalm 121, we acknowledge where help comes from and that we cannot accomplish this journey by our own strength. We recognize that we also cannot fail if the creator of the heavens and the earth is with us every step of the way. In Psalm 122, we pray for, love, and build up the Jerusalem community. And if we do that, we're sure that we will prosper at the, the, the throne of judgment and enter in through the gates of the city. So that brings us then now to Psalm 123. <clears throat> well, let's just read it together. A song of ascent. Unto thee lift I up mine eyes, O thou that dwellest in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look unto the hand of their masters, and as the eyes of a maiden unto the hand of her mistress, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God until that he have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy upon us, for we are exceedingly filled with contempt. Our soul is exceedingly filled with the scorning of those that are at ease and with the contempt of the proud. And so again, in this psalm, we have somebody who's in distress, somebody who's under trial. And in the Companion Bible, there's actually, a, um, he, he refers to a cycle here where, um, and he divides these psalms into groups of three. And so, in a way, Psalm 123 does go with Psalm 120. It's a, a prayer and a plea for mercy. But there's a, uh, this is from a different translation on the screen there, um, from Koran uh, translation. It just brings out a, little, a bit of a different sense there. So it says, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God, until he shall be gracious to us. It's, it's not that he might be gracious to us. It's that he shall be gracious to us. He will be. He will answer this prayer. He will be with us um, in Psalm 123. So our eyes are fixed upon our God. 
until he will have mercy upon us. And again, when we are on our journey, um, God, doesn't, God doesn't need us to ask him for help. God already knows when we need help, and he knows our, the very hairs of our head are numbered, is how the Lord Jesus Christ puts it. So he, he knows, but when we ask him for help, when we say Psalm 123, it creates a new situation where, as in uh, Psalm 121, where we now acknowledge that we need your help, God. Our eyes are on you, God, and we're not relying on ourselves. We're looking to you for help. Unto thee lift I up mine eyes, O thou that dwellest in the heavens. And I'm watching you, God. I'm watching every movement, just as, um, as you watch your employer, somebody that you really want to please. I, um, you're watching every movement of them. And that's how our eyes wait upon the Lord our God. The psalmist says, God, that's how I'm watching you. I'm watching for, for your hand in my life, and I'm watching all the time. I've got my eyes fixed on, on it because I know that you will have mercy on, on us. You will be gracious to us, and I'm watching, um, I'm watching to you, and I'm looking for, for your help. It describes the trials in the world that, w that we have to go through, um, sometimes at school and at work. So it is a psalm of somebody who's in trial. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy upon us, for we are exceedingly filled with contempt. It's like I've had my belly full. That's the idea. I'm overfilled, exceedingly filled with with too much of, of the world and the people that, that we have to deal with sometimes. We can feel like that. Our soul is exceedingly filled with the scorning of those that are, that are at ease and with the contempt of the proud. So I think we could all, in some way, identify with how, this, how the psalmist feels in, uh, in Psalm 123. The Lord Jesus Christ did. He, he identified with that. In uh, Psalm 22, we can uh, just turn back to it. Keep our hand in the Song of Ascent. Psalm 22. Which, which tells us how the Lord Jesus Christ felt. Sometimes the Psalms tell us more how the Lord Jesus Christ felt than the, than the Gospels do. Psalm 22, verse 7, it says, All that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. And that's what they said about the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's how he felt. He felt that. He was in Psalm 123. He was exceedingly filled with contempt, with the scorning of those that were at ease and, and the contempt of the proud. But whatever our trial is, then we can still identify in Psalm 123 because we're still going to look to God for help. Our eyes are still going to be on him. We're going to lift our eyes to him that dwells in the heavens and we're going to watch until we know that he is going to be gracious to us. It's guaranteed that Yahweh will be gracious to us if we keep our eyes fixed on him. So what does that practically mean to keep our eyes fixed on God? Uh, you know, I don't think it means that, obviously it doesn't mean that we're going to drive along and look at the heavens. I mean, that might help us think of it. When we were in Israel, if you've ever been there, people don't drive the same way we do. They drive on the same side of the road, but that's all they do the same. Everything else is distinct. It's different. Uh, they squeeze in the smallest gaps you've ever seen, uh, and all, it's unbelievable. We were, we were pulling onto the freeway, and, uh, and there was a, a guy pulling on uh, beside us, merging onto the freeway, reading a prayer book at the same time. All, everyone in the car saw it. It was, it was doing it. It was real. He's reading a prayer book as he's pulling onto the freeway. I don't know if that morning he didn't have time to do his prayers, but he was doing it then, pulling onto the freeway. So he was keeping his eyes fixed on, on, uh, on the prayer book. He should have been keeping them fixed on the road, I think. Uh, <clears throat> but what does it mean to keep our eyes fixed on God? 
practically. Let's just look at Isaiah 26 and verse 3. It's actually on the screen if you don't, uh, if you don't want to turn it up. Psalm 26, Isaiah 26, verse 3 says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. When it says perfect peace, it actually repeats the word, shalom, shalom, which uh, makes it perfect. It emphasizes it. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. So the word mind, whose mind is stayed on thee, it's the one that's highlighted here. It means uh, metaphorically, which is what we're talking about here. It means a meditation, a thought. So that will keep him in perfect peace whose thoughts, whose meditation is stayed on thee. So that's how we can keep our eyes fixed on our God in a practical way. The word stayed means to lean, to support. So the idea is that thou will keep him in perfect peace whose imagination rests on thee. That's what we need to try and do. And if you're like me, that's very difficult because my mind is pretty active, as my wife will tell you, um, kind of like that ADD thing. Like I have trouble staying focused on tasks sometimes. Maybe a lot of times. Um, and, uh, and I get distracted easily. So it's a challenge. Um, you know, we're sitting there in the meeting. And all of a sudden, you know, we're, we're miles away somewhere else with our imagination. What we need to try and do is keep our imagination fixed on God. And that's what Psalm 123 is saying when it says our eyes wait upon our God. Our meditation, our thoughts are fixed on him until he be gracious to us. And he will be gracious to us. So practically, that means prayer, reading, and meditation. That's how we keep our mind fixed. Our mind stayed on God. And the more we do it, it'll help our imagination. Because our imagination can be very vile. It can imagine uh, horrible things because that's what's natural to us, to our flesh. But we have to change that so that when our mind's sort of on idle, just da 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 right? What does it think about? Uh, we need to try and get it so our mind's thinking about the things of the truth of God's word, and that's going to help us so much. And that's what Psalm 123 is encouraging us to do. So Psalm 123, it's telling us to be patient in trial because we're going to keep watching God and our mind's going to be fixed on him until he'd be gracious to us. But it, it could take a little while. So we're going to have to have patience. So we must be patient in trial, but we know assuredly that Yahweh will be gracious to us. That is a, a promise. So then... Psalm 123, we're going to overcome trials by keeping our eyes fixed on our God and our hope. That, I believe, is the message of Psalm 123. So Psalm 120, recognize our natural situation. Psalm 121, acknowledge where help comes from. Psalm 122, pray for love and build up the Jerusalem community. Psalm 123, overcome trials by keeping our eyes fixed on our God and our hope. That brings us then to Psalm 124. Um, can I just ask the presider what time we finish this class? We're done? Okay. We will start Psalm 124 after the break. Thank you. Uh, this will be a shorter break, 
So try to be back by 3.40 and we'll start our third class.